Next, on the OHIO podcast, we react to the commitment of 2022 recruit Caleb Brown, as well as the transfer of kicker Noah Ruggles. We also review the top 10 2023 recruits on the Ohio State whiteboard before continuing our 64 Sports Movie Challenge. And all of that starts right now. It's so easy to be average. You know it as well as I know it. It takes a little something to be special, Don. It takes a little something special to be a great player. We don't have enough great players. To hell with that! We don't want to coach average. I don't want to be around you. Why be around average? Be proud of our young people in the classroom, in the community, and most especially in 310 days in Ann Arbor, Michigan, on the football field. Three things. Number one, the team that hits the hardest and the longest, the team that starts the fastest, and the team is too damn smart to make mistakes. If you take it to them, if you don't make mistakes, and you keep taking it to them, hell, there's no question who wins. It's time for the best Buckeye podcast by fans for the fans where they hate that team up north as much as you do. It's time for the OHIO podcast. OHIO! Welcome back to the OHIO podcast, everybody. I am your host, Buckeye Boggs, recording live from a steamy north central Ohio in beautiful Delaware. And I am joined by my co-host from Marion, just slightly north of me, and I Assume a very steamy Marion, Ohio, Chris Wilds. How are you doing tonight, Chris? It's hot, Eric. It's hot. <laughs> yes, it is. Hey, yeah, I'm not just talk, talking about the recruiting. This state is hot. Yes, it is. It, is, it is. has been warm and muggy. And you know what, though? It has been beautiful outside. At least the sun's shining a little more this week. I'll take it. I'll take that and I'll take it over. I'll take it over snow and I'll take it over rain. So nah, give me the snow. Give ugh. me the snow. Probably playing football. Come on. Ugh. No, thank you. All right, guys, we have a huge show packed for you with all kinds of good recruiting goodness. Let's start with the big news from this past week, Chris. Caleb Brown commits to Ohio State. This young man seemed to be a strong Michigan lean. He came to Ohio State and last week, the first week of recruiting there on live live on campus again. And it sounds like we were able to flip this man from that team up north, and he's going to be a Buckeye uh, at the end of next season. He is a 2022 class recruit, the third wide receiver in this class. Why don't you tell me a little bit about Mr. Caleb Brown, Chris? Well, I'll tell you, Caleb Brown has great potential. I think he's going to make a huge impact at Ohio State. You know, 5'11", 177 pounds, has good size. He's, you know, he's primarily played tailback a lot through high school, but I'll tell you, he, he's perfect to play the slot, I believe. Um, definitely projects, I think, in, in that role. He's shown good hands. Uh, you know, he's got pretty good straight line speed. Although I don't necessarily consider his speed elite, but, you know, he can break away and make big plays in the open field. You know, he's got that short burst that allows him to get great separation early. Uh, you know, and once he gets the ball in his hands, man, he, he, he's a, he runs like a running back. He is strong. He's physical. Um, I, saw, I saw his film. I'll tell you, I saw him lay a couple of good blocks on people in his film as well. And we all know how, you know, Brian Hartline at Ohio State loves those receivers that can block. And this kid can do that. Uh, he, you know, he's very competitive. Um, you know, but I think possibly his best quality overall is just what you said, Eric. He flipped on that team up north. He is going to be a Buckeye. And, you know, I really think that as as much as he looked like a strong Michigan recruit, I got to feel this is just another sign of just how things are going up there in Ann Arbor right now um, with, with just dysfunction in general as a team. 
Yeah, 5'11", 177, like you mentioned, Chris, from St. Rita High School in Chicago, Illinois. He's 60th nationally, 5th at um, at his position of wide receiver, and 2nd in the state of Illinois. You mentioned it. He's not a burner, 10, uh, 10.84 on the 100-yard dash. Uh, given his speed and moves, he kind of reminds me a little bit of a Paris Campbell and Curtis mm-hmm. Samuel, maybe. Yes. Very shifty. Uh, he creates separation with his quick twitch get off, as they like to say now, uh, in the recruiting world. He needs to repro- improve his hands and catch radius, though, Chris. That's where where yes. Brian Hartline is going to have to work with this guy. Here, I think, is where his value is to Ohio State early on. I think he could be a punt and kick returner right away. Absolutely. Given his, yeah, given his experience on special teams. Um, there at the high school and the running back position that you mentioned. I could see him uh, getting his special teams very early, and then maybe by his uh, end of his second, beginning of his third year, he's kind of that guy who the, you bring in there in the in the zone six as kind of a change of pace guy, kind of a Curtis Samuel, if you will, maybe even a develops into kind of a Paris Campbell. If you remember, Paris Campbell really didn't have a huge breakout season until his last one, his senior year. I think that they could probably sell Mr. Brown on the Paris Campbell comparisons and trajectory. Come, develop, get yourself uh, prepared, have a big uh, big senior season by by your fourth or fifth year, and then go to the NFL and get paid. That's your that's your avenue to the NFL. He's not going to make it there as a running back. It would have to be as that slot receiver type of position. And given his height, I think that's probably what uh, he's looking at. But you mentioned it, and I agree. I think the biggest part of this is getting him away from Michigan in their 2022 class. Um, He, at 60th, uh, I think he's, you know, he would have been one of, if not the biggest on their class. They've got he would have been second. They've got Will Johnson, the cornerback who's ranked 12th mm-hmm. nationally, the five star. After him, he would have been their second highest ranked recruit there at Michigan. Here at Ohio State, he's currently sixth. There's five guys ahead of him, including Quinn Ewers, uh, who everybody knows the quarterback, and then also another wide receiver from Texas, Caleb Burton. So Caleb Brown joins Caleb Burton in that wide receiver class. And then there's also Kion Grays uh, from Arizona, who is 152nd nationally overall in the composite. He's the third wide receiver. And I say we probably get a fourth one. And I'll tell you why I think we do here, Chris. Two reasons. Number one, I think the transfer portal is going to kind of hit that wide receiver room at Ohio State maybe more than any other position possibly because of the talent and depth we have there, number one. Number two, I think we get a fourth guy here as well because guess who was on campus this weekend with Quinn Ewers, by the way, who was back on campus for a second straight weekend. His number one target and teammate from Texas was with him and was taking his official visit to Ohio State too. I think they seal the deal with Quinn by offering his uh, good friend and uh, teammate there from South Lake Carroll High School in South Lake, Texas, uh, a a scholarship offer. So I think that's a possibility. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And I'll tell you, um, and I think if we just look back at the spring game and how we saw chemistry already with Marvin Harrison and Kyle McCord. Yeah. I think that you see the value in having a guy who's got that comfortable, you know, number one receiver that came with them from high school. Maybe he doesn't project to the number one uh, receiver necessarily at Ohio State, but that comfort level is there, and I think it can play a big factor. Yeah. I I agree. I think that that's definitely something that um... – yeah, I think that's something that is going to be of a benefit. That's a good good, um, good observation, Chris, with that. Um, he would definitely be the fourth guy. He'd be the lowest-ranked wide receiver in this particular class. But I think this also is giving Quinn Ewers a bone. You know, hey, yeah, throwing him a bone his way, saying, hey, we appreciate you, and uh, we're going to offer your teammate as well. So we'll see how that points out. Now, Caleb Brown was the, the, the first and the biggest boom, but we also had – 
um, a kicking boom, if you will, this week. And it wasn't a recruit. It was a transfer. I'll be honest. I did not see this one coming, Chris. This one took me blindsided. Noah Ruggles, a senior transfer from North Carolina, has decided to come and be a Buckeye. This this is an interesting move. Uh, first off, your, your 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 thoughts on Noah Ruggles coming to Ohio State. Did you see this one coming at all? I'll be honest. After I was shocked at first, but after I analyzed it, I'm not shocked here, Chris. Well, I I, I was a little taken aback at first, as as you were. But I'll tell you, given the fact that you know he saw that reduction in playing time in 2020. Um, I guess it doesn't surprise me that much that he entered the portal, um, you know. And with Ohio State, de- definitely, I believe needing some help in the kick game. I, I truly believe that that was his, you know, opportunity. Um, although I'll be honest with you, Eric, I don't know quite if he's going to fix all of our kicking issues. I mean, th- this is what I look at. He he is automatic when it comes to extra points. In his college career, he is 48 for 48 with extra points. But he only hits on 70.4% of his field goals. He is perfect inside 30 yards, which is great. And, he, you know, he's, you know, 77% in that 30, um, 30 to 40 yard range. But once you get outside 40 yards, and he's only 50% from 40 to 50, and he's never hit a 50 yard plus field goal. So, yeah, I think he's going to be excellent for us in in the short yardage. But, you know, if we're kicking a bunch of field goals from the red zone, we got bigger problems than the kicking game. So, yes, I think he's going to upgrade the kicking game. I just don't know if he's the answer. Okay. Um, It's not going to hurt to throw him in the competition, right? Oh, no, no, not at all. here's Here's the thing, though. We're now offering two kickers on this team scholarships, it sounds like. Right. So that's interesting. That's something I don't think we've done in a long time at Ohio State. Obviously, we have extra scholarships to offer now because of the transfer portal where people have left. A few guys have left, and so it's, it's offered some uh, space for some guys. Um, but given the fact that we had a big-time recruit come in who was supposed to take over the kicking game this, this year and, and Jake Siebert, His showing in the spring game obviously left a lot to be desired, Chris. And I think the coaching staff looked at that and said, we need to get uh, make sure that we've got someone in here who can kick field goals. Noah Ruggles can do that. You're right. He's he is not as accurate outside of the 30. But let me ask you this question. How many times has Ohio State needed someone to kick a field goal from from 30 yards or beyond for the win? It's been a long time long time if and uh, if we can get the ball inside the 20 yard line <clears throat> and we stall in the red zone he's automatic absolutely and that's why yeah. i i I'm, i'll say this i have more confidence in that guy doing it than jake siebert right now from what i saw in the spring game and i can understand that perspective but with siebert how much of that was the nerves of of being in the shoe for the first time Playing is, you know, being the man kicking there for the first time. You know, so so maybe there was a little bit of, I think, think a little bit of nerves there, but. Okay. I, but, you know, I agree with you. I think that it's good to know that we do have somebody that if we get it to the 30-yard line, we're automatic. Okay. Let me, <clears throat> let me give you a comparison here, all right? Mm-hmm. 2019 stats, I'm not going to use last year's stats because he was injured for a lot of last season. Last year was just COVID crazy. So let's go back to 2019 and look at Blake Hobbiel's stats, okay? Mm -hmm. Uh, Inside the 30, he was 6 of 6. Beyond 30 yards, so from between 30 and 40 yards, he was 3 of 5. That's only 60%. Very Mm -hmm. similar. Now, he was 3 of 3 from – between 40 and 50, and he was one of 150 plus. I think that was against uh, Northwestern. He he bombed a big one. I believe. Um, so you look at those stats and you say, okay, he he's only slightly Blake Hobby was only slightly better than what Noah Ruggles was statistically. So I think he's very comparable there, and I no one really complained too much about Blake Hobby. 
So I think this could be a fix. Now, I, I'm so I'm a little bit more bullish than you are on it. I came away from the spring game feeling very concerned about the kicking game, and I feel like the coaching staff is at least addressing that. And that, Chris, you got to admit, is a positive. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I agree with you 100% with that. Like I said, I think he's definitely not going to hurt the kicking game. He is going to help the kicking game. Um, but as far as is he, you know, is he the answer? Is he the guy that we can count on if we need a big field goal, you know, late in the game from 45 yards out? I don't know. We're going to find out. <laughs> uh, we're going to find out what kind Hopefully of. Hopefully we don't. Well, I, yeah, you're right. But I, I think I think early on this season, given the road game to open the season at Minnesota, yeah. given the big home game in week two against Oregon, the kicking game is going to be. It's going to it's going to need to be there. It's going to have to be there. I do not think we come out and blow the doors off Minnesota and Oregon in the first two weeks. If we do, I'll be shocked because this is a young football team, an inexperienced football team, especially at the quarterback position, Chris. Mm -hmm. If you can get the football close enough, I just don't think Ryan Day is going to be going forward on fourth fourth down very much to start the year. I think he's going to say, I want the points. And so that's what I mean by I think we're going to find out. I don't know that yeah. we're going to find out if we're going to if they can kick a game winning field goal or not. Hopefully we don't, like you said. But I, I'm pretty sure we're going to find out if the kicking game is going to be solid or not very early this season. Uh, your thoughts on that before we move on to the big news about the college football playoff. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. I think, uh, you know, he's, he's definitely going to want to find out just how solid this kicking game is. And. And, yes, I, I do think that he's going to take the points when they're there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if we have Justin Fields and it's fourth and four, he, he might consider going for it. But, yeah, you're not going to do that with a young quarterback, be it C.J. Stroud, Kyle McCord, whoever it may be, Jack Miller, whoever it may be. So, yeah, I, I think that uh, given our situation, it definitely upgraded the kicking game. So. Yep, I'm with you. So that was the other one. I anticipate there being some more recruiting news as far as some more booms here soon. Um, I think Ohio State has been very active in recruiting. They're going after the bigger guys, obviously, the last couple weeks. I just feel like there's going to be a boom or two this week. I got that feeling. So yeah. make sure you uh, stay tuned because that could be something we're talking about on next week's show uh, as a couple of new guys who are joining Caleb Brown and the rest of this 2022 class. By the way, um, this class, I think, is ranked number one now. I think we took it over from Georgia this past week. So not yes. only did we add a recruit, a top 100 recruit, but then Georgia also lost one. And so that helped us leapfrog. So we're not not only number one currently in the Big Ten in recruiting, which isn't a surprise by to anybody. We've been there for pretty much since Urban Myers got to Ohio State. But we also are currently number one nationally right now as well. And a lot of people have been asking, holy cow, where is Alabama? Alabama did this last year. Don't worry. Nick Saban is Satan. He will find yes. a way to uh, to get himself back up there and, and make this a challenge in the recruiting rankings again for next year it, as well. It's so. almost like he likes to hold back on announcing the recruits just so he can pop them all in there at once and say, boom, there we are. Yeah, it, yeah. Sure, it sure feels that way, doesn't it? It really does. All right, guys. So here, let's get into this talk. This is something we've talked about before, Chris. I won't say at nauseum, but it sure feels like it at times. The college football playoff committee met um, the board of regions or whoever they are, and they are they are proposing a change to the playoff structure. Currently, it's the top four. They are proposing not going to six, not going to eight. Going all the way up to 12. Now, if this is approved, Chris, this will not take effect until at the earliest 2023 or 2024, but I heard more leaning towards 2025 as the earliest that this could take effect. Here's what I know, Chris. 12 teams, mm -hmm. the five major power conference champions will be automatic automatic bids, okay? And that would leave seven other open spots for the committee to choose from, including Notre Dame as one, 
And uh, and outside teams outside the Power Five, such as Cincinnati, was a team last year that could have would have been in this UCF in the past. So um, a group of five team, or as they call them, the one Division One AA or the the small D- Division One schools, and then it would be all basically the next best teams who didn't make who didn't win a, uh, their conference championship. So we we're looking at the Georgias of the world more than likely. Uh, possibly even Michigan if they're having a good year, or Penn State. You're looking at maybe a USC or a Washington or Oregon, whichever one doesn't win the Pac-12. You're probably looking at, if it was next year, you're looking at Iowa State and Oklahoma from the Big 12, whichever one doesn't win. My first question, do you like this? Number two, does this feel like it's watering down the regular season and the conference championship at all, Chris? Well, no, I don't like it. And let me also clarify, from what I have heard, and I could be wrong, the four highest-ranked conference champions would get first-round buys, correct? Correct. Okay. Here's my first problem with that. I think this, in part, is an effort to force independents, such as Notre Dame, to pick a conference. Because if they are not a conference champion – They can be ranked number one in the nation. They can be undefeated, but they cannot receive a bye because they are not a conference champion. That doesn't bother me. That That, actually, that that irks me a little bit, you know. Why? Notre Dame should have joined a conference years ago, man. I don't necessarily, I don't necessarily disagree with that, but I do respect their right to be an independent because they don't, as an independent, they aren't playing a slouch schedule. I mean, they typically have a couple decent teams on their schedule. I agree uh, with that. I agree with that. But what did they do last year? They joined the ACC, man. They did. They did for one year. Uh, but that, that was in part because their schedule canceled on them, you know? Um, yeah. So I, I, but I do think it, it kind of hits teams like Notre Dame a little bit. I do think it's great for some of the little guys who may have an opportunity to get in. But the other thing that I don't like about the the whole concept is the fact that there is no limitation on how many teams can come from a conference. You know, and we've talked about it in the past, in this country, specifically in the media, there is a severe SEC bias. Absolutely. We could see SEC teams take up three or four of those spots based upon their rankings and it doesn't necessarily do what it's meant to do which i think is help out the little guy as much so yeah you no, you're right so the thing that the thing that i think noted why notre dame is on board with this is even though they wouldn't be getting a first round buy the first round would consist of four games it basically be teams ranked fifth through twelfth playing one another to, to get to the second round. Those games would be hosted on on-campus sites. So teams 5, 6, 7, and 8 would all host um, teams 9, 10, 11, and 12 on their, in, on their campuses at their stadium. They're going to get the gate for that. Notre Dame's going to make coin from that. So that's why they're not looking at this as a bad thing. Now, notice also Notre Dame doesn't have to play a conference championship game. So there, there's a, there's a, there, there are not only, so Notre Dame is getting, they're making up the financial loss from not being in a conference championship by being able to host a home, home game is, is how they're looking at it. At least that's kind of the excuse I've heard from Notre Dame's athletic director as to why he likes this. But I and, understand and in why. I suppose that is a bye week for him too. Yeah, and I understand why you and others might feel like Notre Dame is kind of getting the hose here a little bit because of that, if you support them being a, an independent. But, and I know it's kind of almost in a, in a way I'm kind of, kind of biting the tail that wags the dog a little bit because last year I was all for Ohio State going independent, you know, but that was out of uh, out of the you know the, the hatred to what. Uh, Kevin Warren and the Big Ten officials were doing to Ohio State due to COVID. And I understand that's why Notre Dame also joined the ACC and played in their conference for a year was because of COVID. 
But let's look at this big picture wise and look at this. This is beyond Notre Dame here, and you brought it up. The SEC obviously is going to get multiple teams in this playoff. If you look at what on a normal year, just a normal year, out of the top 12, when you take away Alabama or or whoever the conference champion will be, you're going to see at least three other SEC teams take up those additional seven spots, in my opinion. That would also include Notre Dame taking up a spot if they were good enough, probably a second Big Ten or ACC team or Big 12 team. You're looking at some conferences, such as the Pac-12, Big 12, Big 10, ACC, on any given year only getting one team into this tournament and only one other team possibly who's not in the big power five schools, who has a great year, who probably would have to go undefeated, obviously. Otherwise, you're looking at this becoming, in my opinion, the SEC Invitational, man. Yeah, you're I, at, I agree. You're at, up to a third of this tournament could just be SEC teams. Now, I'll say this. If the SEC goes to this tournament and they win every game just about, and it becomes three two to three teams in the final four being SEC teams, guess what? Then there's no argument from people like you and I, Chris, but I don't think that's going to happen. I think the SEC, I still think the SEC is overrated. I know a lot of people disagree with me, but look at bowl games. And right, when it comes exactly. to bowl season, they are not nearly, they are not the best conference every single year. It shows every single year. The biasness that comes from ESPN and uh, folks in the South, when it comes to the SEC conference, is astronomically ignorant when you just look at the non-conference uh, results when they play every year. They play other Power 5 schools. And can I take that a step farther? Because if they are not one of those home schools, I think it's going to be a serious, serious slap in the face to the SEC. Because if they have to come into – okay, let, let's say it because the, the quote's out there – East Lansing – uh, you know, in the middle or at the beginning of January, late December, whenever this late December, they're not gonna they're, they're not gonna like that. Oh no, they're gonna get and this. Will, it will be you meant a slap in the face. Yeah, it will be a real slap in the face when they get off the plane and they feel the wind chill, dude. Now, yeah, and, here, and this is all. Oh, I'm sorry, but this no, is the no. other thing about that, Eric. If you're gonna have the first round. Of the playoffs, be at the at the stadiums. Why can't we do the second round at the stadiums too? We can still have our bowls for the the semifinal and the final. But why can't we do that second round instead of doing them on neutral sites? Have those on at the campuses as well. Well, I mean, I, haven't those top four teams earned the right for their fans to to come to a home play or a home playoff game as well? I think the problem with what's going on here, Chris, is that is the college football is still trying to hold hands with tradition, that being the bowl games, right? So, so they're trying to find a way to marry the two or merge the two, the playoff scenario, finding a true champion, the, the NCAA model that has worked so well in basketball, right, and the tradition of college football, which is the bowl games, and they're trying to merge those two, and it's it's not – and we've seen it over the years. More and more bowl games are becoming obsolete they're in college football. They're at this point. They are, unless you are a, a part of the New Year's Six bowl games. And even then, some of those bowl games, when the team doesn't make the college playoff, you have uh, seniors setting out or juniors who are going to be in the NFL draft. They sit that game out. It's even yeah. affected Ohio State. Remember the Rose Bowl a couple years ago? Mm-hmm. Uh, we had a, we had a player sit out then. Uh, it's this is this is happening and it affects everybody. So this is I think the NCAA's way, college football's way of trying to prevent that from happening. Number one, and number two, the other argument they make is that it it, it makes the end of the season more exciting because it's it's allowing more teams to have uh, an opportunity to make the playoff. Late in the season, and, and and let's let's take this one step further too. You mentioned the fact that it's gonna, you know, it's going to make the end of the season more exciting. It's also going to prolong the end of the season. 
Uh, that to me, I mean, and, and let's call this what it is, Eric. This is not about competition. This is not about a better way to find a champion. This is about money. And we know that's what it is. I don't think this has a thing to do with competition. Um, but in this new format, on top of everything else, you're asking these student athletes, in some cases, to go to a 17 game season. To a new, basically, something that, and until this year, the NFL hasn't even done. And it's going to extend the season. It's going to increase the the possibility of, of injury to some guys. Like you said, you got guys setting out bowl games already, and, and now you may have them setting out, you know, a couple of games. Um, yeah, I just I think that you're taking them away from for for the ones who aren't here just to to play football. The ones that actually do come to play school, you're taking and taking more time out of the classroom. I just, I don't like the system overall. I, I like what they're trying to do with it. If they were trying to truly extend opportunity to some schools who deserve to be there, especially in that mid major category. But I think as it's structured, it's set up to, to, to fail. Like you set up, I think, I think it's set up to be an sec invitational, especially in the early going, unless we see something drastic happen over the next two or three years as far as the conferences go. And, you know, I think it needs just, I think they put, need to put a little more time and thought into this, put some other guidelines in place in order to make it a, a successful experiment. Yeah, I agree. I think how you will know if this is about the student athletes or if this is about the mighty dollar is whether or not they decrease the regular season games from 12 back to 11 like it used to be. If they re- if they decrease it back to 11, then I think there are there's legitimacy in what they're saying about this is for this is for the betterment of the sport, it's for the betterment of the student athletes and it's for the increasing of attention for more teams to have to be relevant at the end of the season. If this is all about money, 12 games will remain, and you're right. Teams could be playing a whole lot more football <laughs> in the future than what they are doing now, and I and that obviously increases the risk of injury like you mentioned, Chris. So that, I think, will be interesting. If they reduce the regular season back to 11, now we're talking. Now, now your arguments are making sense to me. But if you don't, then I think you're just throwing out all of these positives – that look good on paper, but at the end of the day, you're only concerned about money. How can we make more money? Because now these kids are going to be making more money too. And, and do you think this is a direct response to the image rights issue as well? No, I don't think this is. I don't think it's in response to the NIL name, image, likeness. What I think yeah. it is a response to is the fact that it, the rest of college football sees that this is basically a three-team race every single year, and it's yes. playing its way out. It's playing its way out every year in recruiting, in recruiting as well. Ohio State, Alabama, and Clemson, all the top guys know those are the top three teams. They have the best chance to win national championships. I think college football looks at this and they say to themselves, how can we make more teams relevant and make, and make the playing field more even? And so if we can get more teams in the college football playoff on a yearly basis, this allows us then to make those teams have better arguments and going after the big name recruits. And it won't just be a three team race all the time with recruits. That is what I think this is for. I could be wrong, but that's my two cents on it. What do you think about that, Chris? No, no, I I definitely I, I can definitely see where you're coming from. Um, I just, like I said earlier, I hope this truly goes to benefit those schools, those mid-majors, especially the Cincinnati's, the UCF's, um, who really, really, I think, and we saw it when Cincinnati played Georgia last year, they were deserving of an opportunity. Gave them a heck of a game. Should have won it, honestly. They really should have, and, you know, the, the fact that they didn't was unfortunate, but, you know, I think they showed they belong in there with the the, the big boys, I think that Fickle showed that he belongs in there with the big boys. And, and 
you know, if they use this to the advantage of those mid majors to make those more relevant, I think they do a great thing for college football. I think if they use this as a format to just boost more SEC teams, I think it becomes a failure. Yeah, I'm I'm with you on that. I I think that this could be become a very ugly thing. It could become a very ugly, um, even more biasness, I guess you could say. We've been complaining about two SEC teams getting into the current structure at four teams now. That's that's just two teams. Are we going to be arguing about four or five SEC teams getting into a 12-team tournament now? I mean, that's ridiculousness. Think if about we are, it. Does that lead to the demise of the NCAA? It because should. Not a, not a lot of people have a lot of love or faith in in the organization as it stands right now, anyhow. <laughs> right? No kidding. Yeah. So there's a lot. There's a lot to be, I guess, ironed out in the coming weeks and months as this thing continues to work its way through what needs to happen. I wish we could go back to the days of of traditional bowl games and then a plus one, which is what we cur- the current structure is supposed to be, is a plus one, basically. Right. Everybody right. plays their bowl games, and then the, the best two teams will hopefully line up and play one another. Some years that was not needed. I mean, some years – Back in the old BCS, it was it was it was obvious who the best team was. So the the, the old traditional college football, the the poetry of it, the pageantry of it, the the fighting to get to the Rose Bowl. Unfortunately, those days are gone, Chris. Unfortunately, and the new generation, it's all about the glitz and glamour and the tournament and and winning it. But I will say this: there is definitely an argument to be made that winning a national championship by a by winning a 12 team tournament that declares that you know you undoubtedly are the best team in college football but i don't know that we don't have that in our current structure as well which is why i think the argument of more teams means a more even playing field has some legitimacy to it, Chris. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I can see where you're coming from, but I, I don't know. Once maybe, I, once maybe I hear the final proposal come out. Once they've ironed out all the wrinkles, you know, maybe it'll sway sway my my thought. But for me, I just don't like it. I'm not even. I mean, I'm a fan of the current system, but you know what? As much as we've changed it in, in my lifetime, I'm ready to just go back to the old AP system. Yeah, I know, right? Like, just bring back the Associated Press. Of course, you know, with all the media bias in the press, it's going to be an SEC team every year. They can have six losses and still crown them champion. But yeah, all right, guys, we're going to take our first commercial break. When we come back, we're going to dive into the whiteboard over at the Ohio State Woody Hayes Athletic Center. The top ten. 2023 recruits who we believe Ohio State is going after. So hang tight. The OHIO podcast is brought to you by Mastermind. Mastermind specializes in 360 degree high definition mobile video mapping, GIS integration, and traffic safety studies. Mastermind cares about traffic safety and keeping you safe on the roadway. Visit Mastermind at OnlineMastermind.com. And welcome back to the OHIO podcast, everybody. All right, Chris, here we go. The top 10, 23 recruits. These are kids who are going into their junior season next year, this fall, of high school. So they were just sophomores this past year. If you uh, follow recruiting like Chris and I do, you know that during the summer, uh, Ryan Day has done a good job of landing a couple 20 or, or a couple juniors in the recruiting classes to kind of jumpstart that class. He's done a very good job of that. He currently doesn't have any recruits currently in the 2023 class, but after some big names. And so that is what Chris and I are talking about. We have looked at this list of who they have offered and who has uh, visited campus 
scheduled to visit campus, and we have come up with a top 10 list of guys who we think are on their whiteboard on who they would like to land in the 2023 class. Let's start with number 10. Chris, you're going to go first, and then we'll go every other until we get down to number one. Go. All right. Well, at number 10, we got offensive tackle Peyton Kirkland, or as I like to call him, Billy Bob, because he is the man-child. 6'5", 330-pound offensive tackle out of Dr. Phillips High School in Orlando. Uh, I mean, the kid's big. He's nasty. Great power. Um, solid technique. He gets really good push. Uh, you know, he finishes his blocks off. And he plays into that second level. I mean, he drives people into that second level. Um, you know, Peyton's top five includes Florida State, Oklahoma State, Arizona, Arizona State, and Arkansas. Um, you know, there's not any predictions in yet, obviously, with him just going into his junior year. But it seems to be a kind of a two-horse race between Florida State and Ohio State. Though he's living in Florida, he is a Chicago native. Is referred to Ohio State as one of his dream schools, and his mom always wanted a, a child that went to Ohio State. So I think Ohio State actually has a pretty good shot at landing the big man. I'm going to give us a 65% chance on this commitment. What do you got, Eric? Mm, that's a good one. That's tasty. Yeah, I, I agree. I think obviously there's a lot of positives here with this particular uh, gentleman being from he's from the Midwest, being the connection of the the mama wanting him to play for the Buckeyes. Um, I like it. I like it a lot. He's a top 100 recruit. I think there's a very good chance. I'm actually probably a little higher than you. I'm at 75. We land Peyton. I think there's a lot of a lot of positives for us. Uh, to get him. And I think he would be a very good guy to start with. Um, like I said, top 100 recruit, not the top offensive tackle in that class, but he's got two more years of high school development. He's got a great body, great size, great figure. I think that there's a lot of positives there. I'm with you. All right, let's take a look at safety Caleb Downs, shall we? He is number nine in this class for us. Now, I don't think that Caleb is um, – as the uh, is the top guy for us necessarily, um, and I'll tell you why that's that's the case later on in this. But <laughs> um, there's a lot to like about Caleb Downs as well. Good size at six foot, 185 pounds. He's from Mill Creek High School in Hashocton, Georgia, I believe. Maybe is how you pronounce that. Uh, he's ranked 37th nationally, third at his position, third in the state of Georgia. Other schools interested include Alabama, Florida State, Notre Dame, and North Carolina. Watching his freshman film, did not get to see a chance to see his sophomore film, but watching his freshman film, I see a very nice athlete who anticipates extremely well, uh, can grow into his frame as he continues to mature. He is a two-way athlete who started as a fre- uh, start who started for his high school team as a freshman. Downs will undoubtedly be playing on the defensive side of the ball, however, when he enters college. He isn't afraid to mix it up in stopping the run, and he has decent tackling technique. His hands aren't the best, but he can still develop them. There are no crystal balls yet for Downs. However, there's been a lot of buzz that he likes Ohio State. So at right now, I'm just going to go 50-50 and say it's probably going to be between us and Alabama for someone who's a top 100 recruit, ranked 37th nationally. So that's where I'm at with him. I'll say we got a 50-50 shot. Chris, how about you? Yeah, I'm right there with you. I, I think he's a 50-50 guy. I think it's going to depend also maybe what plays out with some of our other recruits. Um, and, right. and that could definitely have factor into his decision. But, yeah, I see him as a 50-50 chance as well. Number eight, who you got? Number eight, let's talk about John Walker. John Walker is six foot four, 280-pound defensive lineman from Osceola High School in Kissimmee, Florida. He's ranked 74th nationally. 14 is defensive lineman and 14th in the state of Florida. And John is a four star. He he's a disruptor. He tackles the ball very well, very physical guy. And from the film I saw, he has 
excellent technique as far as bull rush to get himself into the backfield, but he really also showed a pretty good quality swim technique, sheds his blocks really well, fights his way back into plays. I, he looks to me like he plays bigger than that 280, but at the same time, he does it with good speed. Um, I think he'd be an excellent offense on or asset to the, the defensive line. Um, right now, Walker's listed Alabama, Auburn, Florida, Georgia, Miami, Notre Dame, Ohio State, Oregon, Tennessee, Texas, and USC in his top 12. Um, I really think that a difference maker here is going to be Larry Johnson. Uh, we do record, uh, we do recruit the state of Florida well. Uh, Larry Johnson puts out a lot of, you know, quality guys into the NFL as we have seen recently. Um, haven't heard a whole lot about which way he's leaning, but I'll tell you, I really like our chances. I, I'm going to go 40. percent Sounds like John Walker currently in his recruitment is very. Um very uh just kind of getting things going you know what i yes. mean there's yeah. really no buzz to any one particular team no one who's got any crystal balls no one who's got oh that any leaning you know where he's uh being uh rumored to be leaning towards but here is why i feel ohio state has him on their board at this high and that is because of his teammate at number yes. seven, defensive end Derek LeBlanc. This guy is a must get. 6'4, 235 pounds from the same high school as Walker, Osceola High School in Kissimmee, Florida. 54th nationally, 11th at his position of defensive end, 11th in the state of Florida. Other schools interested include. Alabama, Florida, Georgia, and Texas A&M. Watching his sophomore film, LeBlanc's got great size and athleticism coming off the edge. Pretty strong for a young guy. He has a great motor. He never gives up on the play. This is why I think LeBlanc is a must-get. This is a kid who's going to give you 110% every single play. Um, he could possibly move inside given his size. Uh, he doesn't have very many moves currently on the outside, but like I said, he is young, still got two years of development in high school. He has a great bull rush and a speed rush. Did not see him use a swim move at all in any of his films. But like I said, there is no give up on a play and Derek LeBlanc. And I think they offer Walker and LeBlanc both. They've already well offered both. I think they're going after both teammates, but I think given the fact that LeBlanc seems to be very warm on us and has already visited Ohio State and likes us, I think we've got a very good chance. Um, again, I think it's going to be 50-50. I'll go Florida or I'll go Alabama and Ohio State on a coin flip here for LeBlanc. And if we could somehow land both Walker and LeBlanc from the same high school, that is what you call a Larry Johnson home run right there. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And and I'm with you again on that. I think we're I've had us down somewhere between forty five and fifty percent as well. Um so yeah, I'm really excited. And, and I think you're right. I think if we land one, we land the other. And that's huge. All right. Uh well, who's up next? Who's number six? Well, number six is going to be a recent Georgia D commit, and that is athlete Treyon Webb. Treyon is a five-star athlete, six foot, 188 pounds. He's nationally ranked 34th, fourth in the uh, category of athlete, and seventh in the state of Florida. Uh, Treyon actually uh, tremendous talent. Young man even took varsity snaps as an eighth grader down at, Tr down at Trinity Christian Academy in Jacksonville. Wow. Webb has great speed, good field vision. Uh, I think he's equally adept in the films that I saw at either bouncing the ball outside or just putting his head down and running between the tackles. He has good cutting ability and powerful legs that just don't stop moving. He has the, the potential to, I think, really add a lot of talent and depth to that Ohio State running back room. But there is plenty of competition out there. You know, Georgia's still in the mix. Just because he decommitted doesn't mean he's saying no completely. 
You got Florida, LSU, Oklahoma, and Penn State, who are all big suitors right now. Uh, you know, the Buckeyes do have a pretty good recent history of landing guys out of that Jacksonville area, though. I mean, Sean Wade, Tyreek Jackson. Um, you know, this the 2022, we got Jaheim Singletary coming in from that area. I like our chances. Um, I like what uh, Tony Alford does as a recruiter. I'm going to go 45% to Ohio State right now. Yeah, I had I had uh, I had 35 to 40 percent written down, so I'm right there with you on Trey on Webb. Here's one to get excited about. I don't know if you've seen yes, his sir. film, but uh, one running back, Richard Young, number five, six foot, 190, 190 pounds from Lehigh Senior High School in Lehigh Acres, Florida. He's ranked 19th nationally. He's the number one ranked running back in the class of 2023. He's fifth in the state of Florida. Other schools interested include Alabama, Oklahoma, Arizona State, and Arkansas. Now, I think this is going to be a three-horse race. Ohio State, Alabama, and Oklahoma are the three teams that he's going to decide uh, uh, from. Sophomore film, great straight-ahead speed. Hits a hole hard and accelerates quickly, reaching top-end speed in the blink of an eye. Knows how to make one cut and go. I'm watching his film. I think I'm watching Ezekiel Elliott. That's the film I'm seeing. It's one cut, go, run by everybody. Uh, He's got above average hands out of the backfield. Keeps his feet moving when in a pile. Doesn't show a lot of wiggle. Can move a pile, though. So, So he's not a J.K. Dobbins. He's more of an Ezekiel Elliott, if that makes sense to anybody, okay? Um. I'm going to give us, uh, I would say, somewhere around a 50% chance again. Again, this is the big boys here, Alabama, Ohio State, and Oklahoma. Uh, Being from Florida, obviously we're going to have to probably beat out Alabama for this one. Don't see a whole lot of a chance of him going to uh, Oklahoma, in my opinion, but you know how that goes. That could always happen, a visit, and he sees the offensive line there, and it changes his mind, but... I think this is going to end up being an Alabama Ohio State race again, and I don't know. I just feel like this year and next year the tide is going to turn. Pardon the pun. On Alabama, we're going to start to win some of these battles that we've been losing to them in recruiting, and so I I feel very good that we've got a very good shot of landing the number one running back in the 2023 class, Chris. Let me tell you something. I'm going to make you happy here. I'm busting out my crystal ball. This young man just had a very good trip to campus, from what I understand, and and he he liked what he saw. You know, though it's not decided, I'm going to go ahead and give Ohio State a 60% opportunity. I'm going to go ahead and give them the edge over Alabama and Oklahoma. I think that he enjoyed himself on campus. I think he's uh, I think he's going to be a Buckeye. That's my gut instinct. I'm going 60% with him. Nice. Well, that would be the running back position. What about the quarterback position, Chris? Well, at the quarterback position, Nicholas. Good luck with this one. (laughs) With with that? I said good luck with this one. I'm going to say it's I'm a Lavelli or I'm a Lavella. We'll go with that. We'll just call him Nick. How about we just call him Nick? That's better than what I would have done, man. (laughs) Well, let me tell you. Let me tell you a little bit about Nick. He's a uh, four-star quarterback. Out of Warren High School in Downey, California, he's 6'5", 195 pounds. He was ranked 50th nationally, 5th at the quarterback position, and 4th in the state of California. Uh, Nick, as I said, is a four-star pro-style quarterback from Warren High School. Um, He has a tall, lean frame. He does have a big arm. In the footage I viewed, he showed pretty good accuracy in that short and mid-range pass game. Looked like he could improve a little bit on the deep ball accuracy, although the the film I saw could have been limited. Um, he did make some nice passes. Um, he has some athletic ability to help him move the pocket and evade the rush. Uh, but would definitely benefit from, I think, adding a little bit of mass to him. Okay, it's time for me to give you some bad news, Eric. Honestly, I see Ohio State as an outside contender to land. Land Nick. I honestly feel like he's going to stay home in California. I, I kind of feel like USC, UCLA, maybe leaning more towards USC. I'm only going to give us about a 15% chance on this commitment. 
So <clears throat> right now, the, the the quarterback recruiting in 2023 is really interesting. Like you hear you hear a lot of interest one day, and the very next day it seems like the news changes on that guy. It flips. And it's with that with all of the quarterback recruits to all of the main schools. It is, there is no doubt about it that Ryan Day and the rest of this coaching staff are just like every other coaching staff in major college football. They are all jockeying with one another to land their quarterbacks quickly. And the fact that Quinn Ewers is in the class of 2022, I think mm-hmm. kind of hurts Ohio State right Definitely. now in the quarterback recruiting. Because these guys, are they, they, they know if they come to Ohio State, there's basically a 0% chance that they're going to play until their junior year, at least, that, at the earliest. So... I do not think we land Nick. In fact, I do not think we land a top 10 quarterback in this class. Um, and that would include one Arch Manning, okay, the uh, nephew of Peyton Manning, who is a big-time quarterback recruit in this class as well. I think there's a very good chance that we land a, a lesser-named guy, but someone who Ryan Day looks at and says, I like his mechanics, I like his skill set, and I like the fact that I can develop this guy and he can become a backup quarterback for me uh, and, and, and that's something that he can be content with. Because like I said, he's not going to play over Quinn Ewers. He's not going to play over any of the guys who are currently on the roster. And who's to say that we don't come back in 2024 and snag the top quarterback in that class? We kind of go after the top guy every other year and kind of start setting it up that way. Um, also, don't be surprised if maybe we don't land one at all and we're and that's OK because Ryan Day goes after a transfer for that particular yeah. thing. The transfer portal. The transfer portal has changed quarterback recruiting immensely. So. Yeah, I'm with you. I, I at first I was I thought I heard a lot of good stuff with this. I he- I heard that he was very excited about the offer from Ohio State, and then it things have cooled off quickly. So I'm going to go at 10 percent, 15 percent sounds good with me as well that you gave. All right, the next three are what we would call must gets. Okay, number three. Offensive tackle Luke Montgomery, and we have talked about him on the podcast before. 6'5", 260 pounds from Finley High School in Finley, Ohio. 53rd nationally, 5th offensive tackle uh, in the class, and he's 3rd in the state of Ohio. Other schools interested include Auburn, Cincinnati, Duke, Florida, Florida State, and of course, Ohio State. This is a two-way stud. He moves incredibly well for his size. So much so that they move him they move him to fullback, Chris, and their offense to be a lead blocker at times. That's yeah. impressive, dude. Um, he is a great run blocker who just he's got a nasty mean streak, which you definitely want to see with your offensive lineman. And of course, like most young offensive linemen, Chris, he needs to develop better in the pass passing game because just like most high schools, uh, they just aren't passing the football as much. And so their, their pass blocking skills aren't as developed as their run blocking skills. But, uh, this is someone who could come onto campus and be a road grader from day one. Great size, great strength. Now here's what's interesting. Chris Luke has got a younger brother. This oh. younger brother is a quarterback. This quarterback has already received an offer from one Jim Harbaugh and the Michigan Loserines. This is their backdoor ploy to try to get him out of the state of Ohio. And I don't know if you've been to Finley. I'm sure you have. Just right up 23 oh, times, there. Yeah. It's, it's not that far from Ann Arbor. I mean, it's about, it's about as close to Ann Arbor as is Columbus. Yeah. So there is a chance here, guys, that Michigan can start to climb into this recruiting. And this is not by mistake. If you go back and you look at the recruiting rankings from year to year, when Jim Harbaugh has been a head coach at Michigan, they have not recruited the state of Ohio. For all for as long as Chris and I have been alive, Michigan's best teams have been filled with guys from the Buckeye State. That is why they were good. And ever since uh, Jim Trestle came to Ohio State 
and built the wall around the state, the state of Ohio when it came to recruiting, the tide has turned for that team up north. And it has become very evident, if you are getting into recruiting at all, that Jim Harbaugh is starting to recruit the state of Ohio. I don't know why it took him this long to do it, but this is a recruitment that we need to keep our eyes on here. This was someone who was considered a huge Ohio State lean very early on, someone who a lot of people have crystal balled already, in fact, to Ohio State. But the fact that Jim Harbaugh is getting in here like this, not that it scares me. I just find it extremely interesting that he is doing this. Um, I still think we're at a good 80% chance to land him, um, which if you par- partner him with Peyton Kirkland, who you had, who he had at number 10, yes. I think this is a very good um, sign. In fact, there are seven uh, – there are seven uh, – or no, Bill Kerlick, the dean of uh, Ohio State recruiting, crystal balled him to Ohio State already. However, the most recent news is – is that Luke has cooled on Ohio State. I feel I, – I can't help but feel, Chris, that this is Jim Harbaugh somehow. We've got to get back in there. We've got to get Luke to lean back to the Buckeyes and make sure that he is going to be a Buckeye because that is a necessity. We can't lose our top recruits in the state of Ohio, especially at the offensive line, to other schools, especially that team up north, man. And I can't help but feel that his younger brother being recruited by Michigan has something to do with that, man. So I'm still at 75%, but that 75% used to be like 99%. And now I'm kind of like, oh, there's some, there's something going on here. Your thoughts, Chris, on him before we go to number two? Well, I'll tell you what, uh, Eric, for me, um, yeah, I, I, have, I still have him at 80%. You know, Harbaugh can make whatever efforts he wants to. Fact is... I don't see Harbaugh being there by the time this kid hits the hits, hits Michigan. I really don't. Um, I think that's going to play a major factor, especially if Harbaugh has a rough season coming out this year. Um, so, honestly, I still think he's an 80% opportunity for Ohio State, or 80% chance that Ohio State lands this kid. I don't see him going. I don't see him leaving the state. And I certainly don't see him going to Michigan. See him going to Michigan, um, you know. And, and honestly, little brother may be getting offered by Michigan now, but how long is it going to be before the other offers start rolling in as well? So, all right, number two, man, who you got? Number two, let's talk about Brennan Vernon. Uh, Brennan's a, a uh, six five, two hundred forty five pound, five star defensive end from Mentor High School in Mentor, Ohio. Uh, He's tall and long. Definitely has some room to add some muscle, coming in a little lean at 245. He really has the look of a strong side end, but, you know, he's got that frame. He could could bulk up, um, you know, possibly play in, possibly play down on the line as well. Um, Very active. You know, he, he, he runs hot. His motor runs hot. He's always moving. He uses his length to his advantage when he's disengaging from blocks. You know, if given his height, he really gets off of his blocks well and, and can use that leverage for somebody who's actually got a nice high uh, center of gravity. Uh, typically, that's a little tougher for those guys. But he's quick. He's instinctive. He has decent technique. Could possibly become a little more fluid in his pass rush um, and possibly expand his, his Uh, arsenal as far as that goes in technique wise i think he's one that's got a really high floor i think he's only gonna get better i think the recruitment comes down to ohio state notre dame and west virginia for me i really think i like ohio state's chances i'm gonna go with 75 percent that we land him 100 percent he's a buckeye you love it that much already i love it that much already he loves ohio state chris yeah. He is a Buckeye fan. He's born and bred right here in the Buckeye State. He is all about Buckeyes. In fact, I, I would not be surprised when they offered him a year ago, he didn't commit right then. Like, I think that there was a, yeah, I'm going to be a Buckeye, you know? 
So I just think that there's sometimes when they offer those young kids, they say to them, hey, take some time. You know, this offer is not going anywhere. It's going to be here. You know, do your due diligence. Enjoy the process. You you know, and I think that this kid's going to going to do that. But then he's going to be like, yeah, I'm a Buckeye. I, in fact, I'll even say this. I think he commits this summer. I wouldn't be surprised at all. I wouldn't be surprised and, one bit at that. And given his ranking of being a top 100 crew and he's 18th in the composite. This is another uh, big time defensive line recruit from the state of Ohio. All of a sudden, the Buckeye State's producing quite a bit of great high school defensive line talent, man. I can't help but feel that's Larry Johnson's influence on high school coaching in this state, man. I, oh, I, I just, absolutely. I just feel that that's there. All right. Here's going to be an interesting one, guys. Number one from the class of 2023, safety. Sonny Styles, 6'5", 216 pounds from Pickerington Central High School in Pickerington, Ohio, right here in Central Ohio. He's ranked 15th nationally, for, excuse me, first at his position of safety, first in the state of Ohio. Other schools interested include Boston College, Clemson, Florida, Indiana, Florida State. And here's the one to keep your yeah. eye on. Notre Dame. All right. Sophomore film, tremendous size and athleticism for a safety. He covers center field with exceptional ability. He isn't afraid to come down and assist in the running game defense as well. But here's what I have noticed. You will not see this in his highlight film, which also includes basketball, by the way. He's a heck of a basketball player. He will take plays off, Chris. Now, I don't know if that was because he was young. And or, or whatnot, but I've watched several of his games, um, and there are times that he seems disinterested and maybe just taking a few plays off. Now, that could be, like I said, youthfulness. Um, it could be misinterpretation on my point, on my part, because maybe he was lost in the play. But this is someone, given his measurables and giving his lineage, Sonny Styles is the younger son of one Lorenzo Styles from Ohio State, who's also the younger brother of Lorenzo Styles Jr., who ended up going to Notre Dame in the last recruiting cycle. So that is why I said the Notre Dame thing is interesting here. There are currently no crystal ball predictions for him. And I'll be honest, even though he is scheduled to be on campus at Ohio State and he's been over to Ohio State plenty of times, given who his dad is, I don't have a good feeling about this one, Chris, which scares me. Being the number one recruit in the state, the best safety that has come out of the state of Ohio in high school football, maybe ever. This is one I feel like we have to land, but I just feel like Notre Dame for some reason is really pulling him given the fact that his brother went to Notre Dame. And if you say, why did his brother go to Notre Dame and not Ohio state? It's because we offered him as a cornerback and he wanted to play wide receiver. And the coaching staff was honest with him and saying, you're not going to be playing wide receiver at Ohio state. Given the fact that we recruited Marvin Harrison, Jr., Jaden Ballard, and Emeka Egbuka. And so he left and decided to go to Notre Dame. There is no doubt that that taste in his mouth was seen by his younger brother, Chris. I'm scared yeah. about this one. In fact, I'm so scared, I only give us a 40% chance to land the number one recruit in the state of Ohio right now. Oh, yeah, honestly, Eric, I I'm with you. Um, I think a couple factors play into it. I mean, obviously, like you said, his brother being at Notre Dame um, and something that I think probably weighed into to, to his, his brother's you know, decision as well as the position situation. How would you like to carry that name Styles into Notre Dame or into Ohio State? You've got a lot of a lot to live up to. There, there's going to be the expectations. You're ranked highly anyhow. But carrying that Styles name into Ohio State, I think, comes with additional expectations as it does for anybody whose father played um, the game there in recent memory. So, yeah, I'm I'm a little concerned. I had him at 45%. I, I was with you. I was a little bit lower 
a little bit concerned about that, but you know, only time will tell. Now let me yeah. ask you a quick question. Mm-hmm. Who, do, who do we have on him as the lead recruiter right now? Um, I would say it is probably Kerry Combs. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I'll tell you, Kerry's an awful good recruiter, but you know, uh, there's a guy on that Notre Dame sideline now who's oh yeah a lot of attention. Yep. Another former Ohio State guy who's who's running that defense over there, and I'll tell you, yeah, I, I could I, I I'm worried about it. So if I'm with we, you, I got 45 percent on him. Which is why if you go back to last or two weeks ago when we did our 2022 recruiting and we talked about the safeties, there's a chance we land both of those guys and we might be going after both of them hard because they know that they might not land Sonny in the 2023 class. Yeah, that would and that would be that would be a reason why they would be like, hey, we're going to take you both. We need you both because we're not taking any for the next couple of years or at least the next recruiting cycle. So we'll see. I, I don't know that that's necessarily a chance. That if they lose on lose out on Sonny, there will be a safety that they take. Obviously, it won't be someone who is good as Sonny. But, you know, like I said, when you go back up in our list here, um, <clears throat> number was what number was he? Number nine was hey, Caleb Downs, yeah. a safety. And I and I talked about that. <sighs> Losing losing out on Sonny Styles, I think that is why they already are playing with the idea of taking Caleb Downs because I just don't know that Sonny wants to be a Buckeye here. Now, I could be wrong. He could be on campus, and all of a sudden he's like, yep, I want to stay home. I want to be a Buckeye. And there's no doubt that all of his friends are Ohio State fr- fans, you know, uh, big Buckeye fans, being from Pickerington. Um, and by the way, it's not the same high school um, as uh, Sawyer, um, right. Jack Sawyer. That's a different Pickerington High School. He went to Pickerington North. This is Pickerington Central, um, but it is in the same same town, same neighborhood here. <clears throat> so this is this is an opportunity. We'll see. We'll see what happens here. I I think this is going to be really interesting. I don't look for this to be one where he commits in the summer. I think that this is a recruiting uh, a recruitment that goes on into his senior year. I. I I don't expect him to commit anywhere this year. Maybe next summer going into his senior year, but not not anytime soon here, Chris. So this one we'll have to watch here. Yeah, yeah, I agree. But it's going to be an exciting recruiting cycle, let me tell you. Yeah, 2023 is interesting right now. Everything seems to be up in the air. 2022 has been so good. We obviously want to finish strong there. But let's see if we can't get get off on a hot foot here in the next couple months in 2023. All right, we're going to take another quick commercial break. We come back. Man, we had some interesting movies we need to talk about. So hang tight, everybody. Thanks for listening to the OHIO podcast. Would you please help us and subscribe, review, and share our podcast from your favorite podcasting platform? This greatly helps us grow our show and reach more Buckeye fans like you. Also, please visit our website at theohiopodcast.com and follow us on the following social media platforms, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can also email the show at theohiopodcast at gmail.com. Once again, thanks for listening and go Bucks! And we are back. Eric, it's time for our weekly movie matchups. We're uh, delving head on into round two here as we were the last, uh, last week as well. Uh, last two weeks actually as well. Um, so this week we had, as you said, some great matchups going on. In the football category, we had Jerry Maguire, the number one seed versus number nine Varsity Blues. In the miscellaneous sports category, we had another number one seed, Rocky, up against number eight Million Dollar Baby. In the basketball category, we had number four, Teen Wolf, versus number 12, the air up there. And in the baseball category, number three, Bull Durham, takes on number 11, The Rookie. So let me ask Eric, where would you like to start today? Uh, let's go with baseball. I feel like I'm in a baseball move baseball, mood here. Yeah, let's do baseball. Yeah, two great movies. I love both these movies. As I said, number three, Bull Durham. Uh, you know, for me, that movie is all about 
that meeting on the mound. <laughs> that, <laughs> me that to me is the best scene in the movie. You, you know, we're out here trying to figure out wedding gifts, you know. Breathing out of the wrong eye socket. Yeah. yeah. We got dad up there in the stands, you know. It, it, was, it was just a great scene. And it just, Kevin Costner just has this great dry comedic delivery through that whole sequence that just, to me, was incredible. Um, you said you kind of went with that same scene as well? Yeah, that's by far my favorite scene in the movie. It's it's beautiful. That is a That is just a beautifully written and delivered scene by all those actors. I love that part. I just, I love that. I could watch that scene over and over again. Yeah, absolutely. Now with the rookie, you know, I I love this movie. You know, this, this is actually one of my favorite baseball movies. It uh, might not be my top one, but it's definitely, I would say one of my top five or six. And I thought there's so many great scenes in that. I think, Obviously, the scene where he steps out onto the onto the field for the first time in in uh, Arlington uh, as a member of the Devil Rays against uh, uh, the Rangers, you know his whole his whole family, the whole town's there to see him. Yeah, I thought that was a great scene. But for me, really, I think my favorite scene in that, and, and maybe it's because you know, as a father, I think we always kind of want to you know, impress or make our children proud. And when he calls his son and says, you know, hey, guess what? Daddy's a you know to be in the big leagues. You know, that scene, you know, I thought was just kind of moving for me. Um but for the rookie, what was it with you? I love the scene <laughs> where he gets out of his truck. Yes. And he's <laughs> by the the uh speedometer thing that's checking your speed when you do yeah. drive by um um and he, the radar speed detector, I think is what they call, uh, called him. And yeah. he throws it, and it says 76. He can see how down he is. And he walks past it to go pick up the ball that's probably, you know, some 50 yards away or whatever. And all of a sudden, the lights click on, and it was 96. I love yeah. that scene. I, that, that's, that's a good one. That one, I just never forget. It just – it's, like, iconic to me. Um, that's my favorite scene in that movie. But, yeah, he's, there's a lot of good ones um, in The Rookie. Um, it, it's it, it's Disney. It's Disney good. I guess that's the best way it to is. describe. It's Disney good. Yeah, the, 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 another great one was just I think the scene where he goes to the tryout and you know yeah. the, the at the end the uh, the scout comes up to him and says basically, do you know how fast you were throwing? And he's like, oh, you know, kind of blows him off like he's crazy. And he's like, if I go back there. And I tell a guy, them I got a 40-year-old guy out here throwing this fast. They're going to call me nuts. But if I go back here and don't tell them that I've got a 96-mile-an-hour fastball, they're going to fire me. You know. So, yeah, but a lot, a lot of great scenes in both movies. Yeah. This one was a tough one for me, Eric. I'm going to be honest. I'm, I'm, I'm going to take Bull Durham reluctantly over the rookie. You know... I'm right there with you. This one is close. And The Rookie, I think, is a is a good – it's a good film whenever you're just wanting to feel good about life. That's yes. a good one to put on there. But Bull Durham is the better movie. So I'm yes. going Bull Durham as well. Well, it looks like we agreed with the fans this week who took Bull Durham by the uh, count of 23 to 14. And that is going to mean that Bull Durham is going to move on to face the winner of Moneyball versus Major League. Oh, my gosh. That is oh, – that one is going to be very interesting to for me. Very interesting. We, we've said it from the beginning. Top to bottom, I think the baseball bracket was the toughest one to come out yep, of. I agree. I agree. So let's, why don't we talk about a little bit of basketball this time? Let's do it. Okay, so we have number four, Teen Wolf, versus number 12, the air up there. So for me and Teen Wolf, I, I think the, the scene that's, uh, you know, and there were several, but the one that sticks out most to me is definitely the scene where he, he changes for the first time on the basketball court. <laughs> Everybody's just kind of like, huh? Yeah, just kind of 
standing there staring at him. He just goes dribbling away. Yeah, but yeah, I, th- I think that scene to me, um, that either that or the the roof surfing, you know, that roof surfing, like you mentioned, I think a few weeks ago, that just kind of sticks there in your mind is like, who didn't want to try that in the eighties and nineties, you know? <laughs> right. But but yeah, for me it was it was that first transition in the uh, at the basketball game that did it for me. Teen Wolf for you, Eric. So it's definitely the roof surfing. Um, I love the scene where he's in the bathroom as well, and his dad knocks on the door, and he opens it, and his dad's a werewolf too, and he's like, "I should have told yeah. you earlier." You know that one, the 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 nonchalantness about it, I think, it just makes the film. It's got a, it's got a a, a cuteness to it, a, a a charm. I guess it's mm-hmm. just charming film, and how it approaches uh, this particular type of, um genre uh, of film of course yeah. at that time at that time all the werewolf movies in up until the 80s are about werewolves are dangerous killers right uh yeah. you've got the silver bullet the werewolves in london yeah. the howling those those films right and then you look at where the that particular genre has gone since with Twilight and crap like that, and you know, I, and sorry if you like that stuff, I, I I can't stand it. But to me, Teen Wolf has just got a. It takes that particular topic, throws some athleticism in it with being in high school in a coming of age film with mm-hmm. basketball, and it's just charming. It's just a charming film, and so I think that those two particular um, parts of the film are are rememberable, and they're rememberable for they're charming. In fact, the whole roof uh, surfing scenario actually came up this weekend when we were camping, and my uh, my son and his friend they uh, uh, we were going to go fishing. We went. Uh, I threw them in the back of the truck, and then they sat in the back of the truck. And I said, "Hey, if we had a van, you could climb on top and you could roof roof surf like they did in Teen Wolf." And they looked at me like, "What are you talking about?" And I'm like, "Okay, this generation needs to watch Teen Wolf for that alone, right there." So. <laughs> I'll take the roof surfing as well, but the air up there, mm, watch that oh, again man. this week. It's been a while since yeah. I've seen it, Chris. I'll tell you, I love the air up there. I, as I've said, this is one of my favorite sports movies as well. Um, you know, Kevin Bacon, I think, is amazing in this film. I, I love the scene where he actually goes through the trials to become a member of the tribe uh, so that he can play basketball with them. You know, that just he, he is that coach who's going to get that recruit at all costs. I love that. But for me, the best scene is still at the end, the uh, the Jimmy Dolan shake and bake scene with Sala there, you know, going, you know, just kind of educating that his opponent there and then taking him to the hole um, and kind of the culmination of the film. Loved it. Um love everything about this movie, though. Like I said, I, I love the interactions between Kevin Bacon and the nun. Those are great. You know, she's allowed to cuss, but only if she really means it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, so, yeah, for me, I think it was the, the final sequence there to where he's, well, not necessarily the final sequence, because the final sequence you're seeing at the university. But, uh, yeah, that, that final basketball game, the end of that, I think that was just, you know, tremendous. Um, how about you? Back it up a little bit before that, in the locker room at halftime, uh, what what you I guess what, whatever you could call a locker room for being in Africa, right? And he, he Kevin Bacon's character, his knee is is hurt obviously, yeah. And he and he has that conversation with the recruit, and and Jimmy says to uh, Sal, Sala, hey, look, you don't have to come to St. Joe's anymore. This is, this is about, you know, you, if you don't want to come, that's fine. I understand it. And, and, and Salah's like, well, I, I will, if, you know, if we win, I'm going to come. And, and, and Kevin Bacon's character, Jimmy Dolan says, this isn't about you coming to St. Joe's. It's a, it's more than that. When yeah. the film changes and it's not about recruiting this guy anymore, it's about defending the pride of this tribe. Yes. Okay. It is these people that switch right there that happens in the movie is very good. And it's, it's very touching and it's very strong. And I think Kevin Bacon, um, 
he acts the heck out of that scene right there, man. That is he really does. That is a really, really good scene. That's my favorite in air up there. All right, so here we go. Here's the question. Who do you have? All right, so we we caused air up there to move on to this point, okay? It lost its opening round matchup as far as the popular vote to Space Jam. I hate Space Jam. It's it's a cute movie, but it's it's nowhere near as good of a film as Air Up There. I don't hate Teen Wolf, Chris. And so I am going to go with Teen Wolf and probably upset you here. I just love Teen Wolf just that much more a little bit than Air Up There. Eric, you disappoint me. I That's know. Okay. Sorry, man. I still got Aaron on my side, though. He was one of the two people that voted for the air <laughs> up there. Yeah. And a got, slam yep, dunk. Yep. Teen Wolf moves on 29-2 to two over the air up there. But Teen Wolf, it was nice to have known you. <laughs> next week, you get the Hoosiers. Oh, yeah. Their next matchup in a couple weeks is going to That's going to be a tough one. That would be the upset of the tournament right there. Yep. All right. So we've got Bull Durham and Teen Wolf both moving on so far. How about going to a little bit of football? We've got number one, Jerry Maguire, versus number nine, Varsity Blues. Jerry Maguire, let me tell you, I like the movie. I don't love the movie. Um, I think it's got some great scenes, but as much as it's Tom Cruise, I think Cuba Gooding Jr. really makes this movie. Um, for me, there's two great scenes, obviously, that just jump out to, out to me. One of them is Show Me the Money. <laughs> Everybody knows Show Me the Money. I love and black he, people. <laughs> I love black people. Yeah, that, that whole sequence. He's like, that's why you're my agent, you know? That and then the scene where Tidwell's playing on the, the, the one year contract gets hurt. Uh, you know, and the whole stadium goes just silent. And he just slowly gets up. Yeah, just that those two scenes for me, Cuba Gooding Jr. makes that movie. For me, it's not Tom Cruise, it's not Renee Zellweger, definitely Cuba Gooding Jr. And those are my two favorite scenes from the movie. How about you? Okay. I'm going to surprise you here. I watched this movie with my wife this week. We sat down. We watched it. It had been a long time since I saw Jerry Maguire. This is the number one movie in the, fo- in the football bracket, which was shocking to a lot of people. But remember, our, our rankings come from Flick Chart and the popularity overall – of moviegoers that aren't just sports fans, they're movie fans, okay? Mm -hmm. Jerry Maguire is a strong, strong love film. Yes, I agree. It it really is. You had me at hello? Come on, dude. What what guy hasn't, you know, said those lines at some point, you know? What woman hasn't said those lines? Or the line about... I love him for the man he he is and the man he almost is and the man he will be line. Yeah. I mean, the, their, the, the love aspect in this film is strong. It is a strong and, – and at, at that time, this is during the time when this movie came out. This is on the heels of like um, You Got Mail. And yes. those really popular love movie films with the with the the hunk, you know, of Hollywood and a very popular female actor um, playing the love interest uh, who's able to tame this wild horse's heart type of thing. And the fact that Jerry Maguire throws a very interesting twist to it and the fact that Jerry is a is a sports agent who has a moment of clarity in his life where he writes this mission statement that causes him to to lose his job. And then the relationship that he has uh, with Tidwell to be the only player left that he has and it's all riding on him. It's strong film, dude. Much better than I thought. I've yeah, seen, and I like the relationship between McGuire and the little boy as well. 
oh, it's it's cute as a button, right? You know, like there there there's so much more to this movie. I've seen the voting on this, and I get it. I understand why. From a pure football standpoint, Varsity Blues blows <laughs> Jerry Maguire out of the out of the water. But if if we if we said which film which film has more memorable lines which film has a better love story which you know all these other other categories Jerry Maguire is the better film um those were some of my my favorite parts to it so before I tell you who I'm voting for let's talk about Varsity Blues and can I just I'll just say one line here before you talk my my favorite part of the movie I've got several but tonight how about Billy Bob TD, baby? Let's go. Oh, with yeah. Billy Bob's Billy touchdown. Bob. He, he deserves some love tonight. So I'll say that's my favorite part of the movie tonight. I'll tell you, I love Billy Bob. You know, I haven't even heard me reference him a little bit earlier. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, for me, I'll tell you, I, I love Billy Bob. I love Tweeter. The, those guys crack me up. Um, but for me, I think it was when they go in to halftime of the final game mm-hmm. and, and they're getting, you know, they're getting ready to put the needle into uh, Wendell's leg and, and uh, Vanderbeek's character just stands up and he's like, no, no, that needle goes in his leg and I'm out. And the whole team says the same thing. And then he gives that just really inspirational halftime speech about going out and being a hero. You, you know, I think, I, that for me, I loved it. Um, probably I loved the halftime speech there even more than the football action. And I thought there was some pretty good football action in the game as well. Um, you know, so yeah, for me, that was it with Bar- Varsity Blues. Here we go, Eric. Big question time. Who moves on for you? It's Varsity Blues, but it's nowhere near the 47-7 to 7 vote that you're going to say in a minute. Yeah. There, there's, it's so much closer than that. Jerry Maguire was not ranked properly. I'll give you that in the in this yeah. category or in this um, this bracket. It is not the number one film, but like I said, we took those from Flickchart. Not its fault. Varsity Blues is the better film, and I understand why. Yeah. And I agree with you. And I think this goes back to, uh, you know, a while back in in this tournament, I think I talked a little bit about what I consider a film and what I consider a movie. Yeah. Uh, and the, how the, the actual production, the quality versus the entertainment value. For me, the entertainment value was definitely there. I think Varsity Blues is the better movie, while McGuire is the better film. Um, so I agree with you and the fans. As you said, the fans blasted. McGuire out of the water, 47 to 7. So that is going to go on to face off against Friday Night Lights. Friday Night Lights. Woo! Probably the two best high school football movies. Eh, no, there's also Remember the Titans, I guess, and Facing the Giants. Two of the best, we'll say that. Two of the best high school football movies ever made. Yes, and they have, and I think they have two of the best final game halftime speeches. Mm-hmm. This it's is really also, good. this is also, that means Jerry Maguire is our first, first number one number seed one to seed. go down. Yes. Yeah, uh, and I'll tell you, um, in our miscellaneous sports bracket, we saw another one number one seed in action this week, and I thought it was going to get a little more competition than it did. Um. And that is number one Rocky versus number eight million dollar baby. And Rocky, you know, it's iconic. So many great films, or so many great uh, scenes in the film. Um, you know, the training montages, the uh, just everything that goes into it. I think one of the the best scenes for me, though, you know, obviously I love the final fight. I love the way it ended with him not winning that fight. Um, the whole concept, uh, the, the whole exchange where ain't going to be no rematch. And he's like, I don't want one. But I'll tell you, for me, I think it was the dynamic when 
Mickey had refused to train Rocky, and then Rocky and Mickey have that exchange when Mickey wants to come back and train him for this fight now. And I think that, you know, Rocky's like, well, you know, why? You know, basically, you thought I was a bum, you know? Why now? And, you know, he, he makes Mickey earn it a little bit to come back and train him. Uh, I think that exchange is uh, one of the best scenes in the movie. It is. It is actually, I, that's the one I wrote down, too. As when I went back and watched this film this week, the I really, for some reason, that scene sucked me in more than I had ever yes. before. Like, when I watch Rocky movies, I'm watching the, the action. I'm watching the training montages, like you said. But for some reason, that 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 uh, exchange that Mickey and Rocky have in his apartment is so strong. And you know what else I that that kind of caught me off guard this time in my second viewing of Rocky. Well, not my second. I've seen Rocky many times. Second but, recent viewing. Yeah. The, the 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 it's been a long it's actually been a long time since I watched Rocky. I always go to Rocky two, three, or four. Always. I I just skip over one for some reason. And the fact that this one caught me off guard, the the love story in Rocky yes. is better than I remember it being. It's good. Okay? It's very good. So so Adrian pa- played by um uh Tanya what's her? Shire. Thank you. I knew Shire. I couldn't remember her first name. Going from kind of like um, very home homely looking and and nerdy almost to uh, this beautiful woman when all all and all she has to do is take off her glasses and the fact that the world can't see her true beauty because they see the glasses yeah. and Rocky's able to see the beauty beyond the glasses and when he takes them off it gives her this sense of confidence and the fact that here's this this strong man from the neighborhood who loves her for for more than just her beauty but for her her mind and for her as a person is very good movie making man and if you really watch rocky that's what rocky is about at least the first yes. one because at the end of the fight it's all about making sure she gets into his arms that she helped him accomplish this unforeseeable feat that he did by being this nobody with this terrible uh, boxing record that wasn't worth anything because he had no training. Because as Mickey said, you're a bum. And here he goes toe-to-toe with the world heavyweight champion for 15 rounds. And he almost wins the darn thing, right? Split decision. But it's all about, hey – I love you, and you were the one who helped me through this. That was powerful, man. I just don't remember it being that powerful, and it got me. And so, yeah, and and here's what's amazing about this film. Stallone wrote this thing, man. Yeah. That's just – what a talented dude. That my favorite. I believe he wrote and directed, didn't he? uh, He didn't direct, no. Uh, They had a – no. He didn't direct the first one, but – um, he did write it, and he was obviously a big part of of that. But um, yeah, the scene with Mickey is powerful, um, and then obviously the very ending scene is just so touching with him and Adrian. So th- that's my favorite. But all right, Million Dollar Baby, dude, what what in the world? Why doesn't this film get the, any love at all, Chris? Yeah, it, I'll tell you because it was a tremendous film. It really was. Um, you know, I thought the action was great. You, you've got Morgan Freeman in there. You've got Clint Eastwood. I mean, these guys are heavy hitters. You had, you know, a, a, a younger Hillary Swank going in there who really had just, you know, started making her bones and was, you know, I think, uh, actually, if I remember right, won an Oscar for this film, if I'm not mistaken. You know, just a tremendous, tremendous movie filled with power players. You know, for me, and I'm, I'm not ashamed to say it, I got a little teared up at this scene. The the scene where she's in the hospital mm-hmm. and Clint Eastwood decides to help her end her life. Mm-hmm. That scene for me, I mean, over all the other scenes in the movie, it, it got me, it choked me up. I'm not afraid to say it. Um, I thought it was an extremely powerful scene. 
Um, so how, how about for you, Eric? Million Dollar Baby. All right. So Million Dollar Baby, The for the people who throw shade on this film, I don't get it, guys. This is an amazing film. I love this thing. Um, let me let me highlight two parts. Number one, when she starts knocking people out basically in the first few seconds of the first round, and there's that scene when mm-hmm. Clint Eastwood's character ha- – basically he removes the, the little bench from the corner, and he turns around, and he has to t- put it right back because the end of the fight's over. You can kind of see it in his face like, yeah, this isn't helping you. <laughs> I love that. That – that is that's all acting and facial features, which I think Clint Eastwood is one of the best at doing that, dude. Dirty Harry, anybody? Um, yeah. So that that scene. But then here's what really caught me in the second viewing in the last month and a half of this film. Yes, I've watched it twice now. Morgan Freeman and Clint Eastwood's uh, characters, Frank and Eddie. Yeah, their dynamic. their dynamic between the two is powerful. And then the scene where he blames him, he blames yes. him for what has happened. That is powerful. But here is why this film is so good and why some of you people, I again, I just don't get it. The fact that Morgan Freeman is narrating this film throughout makes it – it makes it poetry, dude. It well, is he's so, the voice of God. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> but you, I, it just, it's so subtle. You don't even really notice it. It's yeah. so subtly good. This film, again, uh, people were really throwing shade at this thing this week. And it got destroyed in the voting. And I'm like, what in the world? My wife loves. She watched, She actually watched both these with me, too. Um, she th- she thinks Rocky's good. It's okay. She loves Million Dollar Baby. And so, again, I think people need to either A, watch it for the first time who've never seen it and didn't vote for it, or B, go back and re-watch it. It's much better than what it's it, it got in the voting here. So that's my challenge to people. It's a very good film. Yeah, absolutely. But here's the question, Eric. Who do you go with? As much as I want to go with Million Dollar Baby and just basically make everybody mad, it is not Rocky. Rocky is iconic, and it is still, even though it was made in the 70s, Chris, the thing still holds up today. I'm going to go ahead and go with Rocky, but I will say this. I was tempted very tempted to go with Million Dollar Baby. I'll tell you, I'm not going to lie, Eric. I was as well. And I'm a huge Rocky fan. Don't get me wrong. I love Rocky. And I'm going to go with Rocky. But I was very, very tempted as well to go with Million Dollar Baby because, like I said, until the, the movie tournament, I had never seen this movie. And wow, I had no idea what I was missing out on. It was tremendous. Unfortunately, it's not going to see the next round. And the fan vote was, I'm going to call it absurd. <laughs> it really, yeah. It, there's no way that that film deserved only three votes. But by a vote of 64 to 3, Rocky's going to go on. It is going to face the Karate Kid in the next round. And wow, that that that's going to be a tough tough matchup, I think. There will be people who voted for Rocky who love Karate Kid, but who will vote for Karate Kid in the third round. But will it be enough to make a difference? Because if you look at the first two matchups, nobody has dominated the competition more than Rocky has, yeah. and that includes Hoosiers, Chris. Yeah, and that's very surprising to me. That that is extremely surprising to me. Not so much that Rocky is moving on or doing well, but just by the difference in the voting, and the amount of votes that Rocky is getting is just tremendous. Mm-hmm. So that means we have one more week of second round matchups. We've got Slapshot versus Happy Gilmore in the miscellaneous sports bracket. 
that's going to be a lot of fun, Chris. That would be very interesting. You, we mentioned it earlier, Moneyball versus Major League in the baseball bracket. Again, I, I'll be very interested to see what goes with that, how that one goes. You've got a fan favorite in the replacements who was a upset over the blind side, but now it goes up against a very strong football film. And remember the Titans, will it be able to pull off that upset in the football bracket? And then in the basketball bracket this next week, we've got white man can't jump and coach Carter. Again, I have no idea which way the fans are going to go here. There's a lot of very interesting films next week, Chris, and to end the second round like that is going to be strong. And then we get into basically what anything could happen. Sweet 16 at this point, again, anything could happen, Chris. Yeah, absolutely. I'm just I'm really excited about the next wave of movies. I'm telling you, I'm going to have to watch. I love Remember the Titans, but, you know, I, there's a soft spot in my, in my heart for Footsteps Falco. I know. You're not the only one, Ohio dude. State guy. <laughs> You're not the only one. I tell you, it's a fan favorite, man. It really is. And I'm, I'm really excited to see what happens with that one, as well as the other matchups uh, we have coming up next week. Really excited about getting to the Sweet 16. Not just because we edge closer to a champion, because that means we are that much closer to the kickoff of Buckeye football for the season. So... With that, I think that brings tonight's show to a close. As always, be kind to one another. I owe someone's OH and send Carmen, Ohio with all your heart. And until next time, OH! I owe! Go Bucks! Oh, come, let's sing, oh, Hios praise and songs through Alma Mater rain. While our hearts rebounding thrill and joy which death alone can still. Summer's heat, oh, winter's cold. The seasons pass, the years will roll. Time and change will surely show. How firm thy friendship, oh, high, oh.